Welcome to Biblical Baptist Church Friday evening Bible study. Tonight we will discuss about Matthew chapter 21 from verse 1 to 27. We will see our humble king riding on a donkey going to Jerusalem. When our king arrived inside the temple, he saw that, that the Jews made it a house of merchandise. We will also see what he will do to a fig tree which has no fruit in its season. The chief priest and the elders asked Jesus where did he get his authority. Our team, let us be fruitful in our service to the Lord. Again, teach the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verse 1, 27. The first thing we learn over here is that our humble king arrived in Jerusalem riding on a donkey from verse 1 to 11. So the king rides triumphantly into his capital, Jerusalem. Verse 1, And when they drew nigh into Jerusalem and were come to Beth page unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to disciples. The time was come for our Lord to finish his great work on earth, and his going up to Jerusalem was with this intent. He now determines to enter his capital city, Jerusalem, openly, and there to reveal himself as king. Notice in verse 2, saying unto them, as so Jesus is sending his disciples and said, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. So he, the Lord directed them to the place where they should find the animal. The Lord knows where that which he requires to be found, right? In verse 3, the Lord continued, he said, And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord had need of them, and straightway he will send them. So the owner of the ass and their cult regarded it as an honor to furnish Jesus with a creature to ride upon. How great is the power of Jesus over human minds. It is grateful, right? It is great. Now, the prophet, uh, uh, the prophet prophesied our lowly king. This is Zechariah on his prophecy in chapter 9 of Zechariah verse 9. Now, in verse 4, Matthew noticed this in Zechariah, and he said in verse 4, All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, right? So every point of detail in the life of our king is according to prop prophetic model. Right? Now, Matthew continues in verse 5 on this prophecy, right? Tell ye the daughter of Z Zion, behold thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt, the fall of an ass. So that's the prophecy of Zechariah. The Old and New Testaments harmonize into its other. Men have written harmonies of the Gospels, but God has given us a harmony of the Old and New Testament he had before said of himself. Notice in Matthew 11, going back to Matthew 11, verse 29, he said, I am meek and lowly in heart. And now he gives one more proof of the truth of his words. Why? 
because we, as we continue in this chapter, in verse 6, it says, And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. You see, our Savior is, <laughs> is meek and lowly in heart. He's going to be riding what? Not a, a stallion. He is he's going to be riding a, a donkey, right? So, the disciples did, did not question or criticize their king's command. So, in verse 7, and, and brought the ass and the colt and put them and put on them their clothes and they set him their own. So, they put Jesus on the top of the ass to ride upon, right? So they carried out they carried out their king's beating in every detail. They even put their clothes that our king may sit upon. So the now the king was greeted with great multitude. In verse 8, and every great multitude, oh, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way and then others cut down branches from the trees and throw them put them together in the way so now you see that the crowd was in a state of great excitement and came marching along with jesus in high enthusiasm our king did not get a red carpet welcome but the people carpeted the road they spread their garments in the way and as if they this were not uh, enough others cut down branches from the trees and throw them in the way right they throw them in the way in verse 9 it says and the multitudes that went before and that followed cried saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So the multitude became multitudes. They grew in numbers. With one voice they applied Psalms 118 verse 26 to Jesus. <clears throat> they said, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. You see. The people of Jerusalem were amazed at the king. In verse 10, and when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? They were shocked, right? He had been there before, but not on this kind of situation, on this wise. Never had such enthusiastic multitudes surrounded him with acclamations. There is nothing that can move mankind like the coming of Christ. So everyone inquired, Who is this? <laughs> That's what the people, this multitude said, right? Now in verse 11, it says, And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth. Of Galilee. You see? So the people answered there. Many people asked, Who is this? Then many other people answered the question. This is the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. So the answer of the multitude was true, but not all the truth, right? See, Moses prophesied the prophet 
is there. They could have said, this is Jesus, the prophet that is coming, right? But they said, of Nazareth. Anyway, <clears throat> seldom is a multitude to so well inform us in this instance. He's not just a prophet, but the prophet, you see. You can read Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, verse 18. You will see that. He is the king of kings, according to Revelation 19.16. He is the coming Messiah, according to Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 to 26. He is the prince of peace, according to Isaiah 9.6. Note, where Jesus comes, he makes a steer and raises inquiry. Who is this? It's a pro proper, profitable, personal, pressing question for every sinner. Oh, that many people will ask this question. Who is this that they may find eternal hope in him? Our second point is this. Our holy king cleansed the dirty house of God from verse 12 to 17. Now the king cleanses the temple once again, right? In verse 12, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that saw, sold doves. This was his second cleansing or purgation of the temple. He had cleansed it once before in his earlier ministry. You can look at John chapter 2 verse 13 and 16. Alas, when good things begin to be perverted, they need many cleansings before they are set aright. Right? In continuation, in verse 13, and he said, And said unto them, this Jesus said, right? It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer. But ye have made it a den of thieves. You see, the house of God became the headquarters of the thieves. Right? A temple dedicated to God must not become a place of merchandise and robbery. Neither the temple guard of Roman soldier did not apprehend the Lord. An opposition of power ceased. <laughs> Why? Because it's the power of the Lord. How can you resist the power of the Lord? Unless He allows you, right? So in verse 14, And the blind and the lame came to Him in the temple, and what? He healed them. You see? The blind and the lame come to Him. Where else should they come? See, was the temple not the house of mercy as well? Yes, it is. Right? <clears throat> now the king acknowledges the children's acclamations. In verse 15, And when the chief priest and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, right? Healing the sick, right? In the temple. And the children crying in the temple and saying, this is what the children say, Hosanna to the son of David. They were so displeased. They don't like that. Lifting up Jesus, the son of David, who will take over the kingdom of David, right? So the chief priests and scribes are ever on the watch. Nothing that glorifies the Lord Jesus escapes their eyes. 
right? Whenever Jesus promoted the, you know, deceit and they get upset, you see. You know, the enthusiastic shouts, shouts of the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, infuriated them. Notice in verse 16. And said unto him, to the Lord, right? Hearest thou what this say? And Jesus said unto them, Yeah. Have you never read? See, this now from the prophecy. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected grace? See, Jesus values the praises of children and allows them give him their hearts while they are yet young. Because when they get old, sometimes it's too late. In verse 17, And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. You know, he, Jesus loved the, the quiet and hospitable care of the household of Lazarus. Because Lazarus, with his sisters living at Bethany. So, Jesus loved not the quibbling ruling priest, so he left them, right? Doesn't want to waste his time with them. No, our Lord, while he drives out the profaners of the temple, vindicates his, his holy violence by saying, it is written, whether he was contending with the arch enemy or with wicked men, you know, the arch enemy is the devil, right? Or wicked men, he used but one weapon, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So when our king takes to himself power such as in cleansing the temple, opposition ceases. So when he, is, he uses power, nobody can add up. Nobody can oppose him. But I like what the Lord was doing is every time they confront him, he used prophecy. He used the word of God, you see, to um, vindicate himself, to justify what he was saying. Thirdly, our fruitful king cursed the fruitless fig tree. Verse 18 to 22. <clears throat> So the king returned to the city of Jerusalem, right? In verse 18, now in the morning, he returned into the city. He, he hungered. Can you imagine, brethren, that our king and creator was hungry? The people of the house where he stayed that night probably neglected to provide his breakfast. Or maybe he was so focused in accomplishing his works that he forgot to eat bread in the morning. Or he bypassed the breakfast, right? Now in verse 19, And when he saw the, a fig tree in the way, he came to it. Oh, now we see why the Lord bypassed the breakfast. Uh, he saw a fig tree and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee, hence forward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. You know, the nature of a fig tree is that the fruit comes, then the leaves. <laughs> the fruit Leaves. If a fig has leaves, it should have fruits on it. <laughs> this fig has lots of leaves, but no single fruit. This resembled Jerusalem, which was robust in religious pretense, 
but it was destitute of repentance, faith, and holiness. Like the modern Christians today who are full of profession of salvation, but there is no fruit, true fruit of salvation, of understanding His word, and no keeping of the word of the Lord Jesus Christ, our King. You can look at John 14.23. Jesus said, If any man keep my word, he's the one that loves me. You see. Now the disciples saw what happened to the fig tree. So, did you see? When Jesus went to Jerusalem in the morning, the disciples are with him already. <laughs> I don't know where did they sleep. Where, where did they? they probably slept also in the house, maybe. But anyway, in verse 20, and when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? So it withered so fast. That's what they're saying, right? The Lord's word was so very quickly fulfilled. The disciples wondered. We know this also, that sometimes our prayers are answered right away by his mercy. Now in verse 21, Jesus answered and said to them, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you, if ye say, shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. <clears throat> to the first disciples, the power of absolutely working miracles was uh, given by our Lord. And in given and, and given in connection with a simple, genuine, unwavering confidence or faith. Did you notice the prerequisite of kings unleashing his power? He said, If you have faith and doubt not, you see, our case is that we have faith, but we also have doubt. Because Jesus said, if you have faith and no doubt, then your prayer will be answered. But if you have prayer and you have doubt, then th there's a problem, right? What's it? What, <laughs> what is it? You know, some Christian says, if you worry, why pray? Right? <laughs> So our case is that we have faith, but we also have doubt. The Lord is looking for doubtless faith. Brethren, we need to believe without any doubt on the part I king. So the mountains is a illustration. Illustration of difficulty and indences will be removed with real faith. Because we have not seen any disciples that have moved mountain physically. So this must be a <clears throat> uh, an illustration. Our king says that he will answer our prayers with faith. You see? Did you notice that our kings or our king says that we can make barren fig tree, tree, trees, life, dies, and obstructing mountains depart from our life in prayers by what? Faith without doubt. If we have faith and doubt not, we shall know the truth of this promise. We'll be able to become fruitful and and our prayers will be answered. Notice in verse 22, he said, All things whatsoever you shall ask in 
prayer, believing so that the faith ye shall receive. Right? That is faith without doubt. <laughs> so this promise of our king gives us a grand check book on the bank of faith, which we may use without string attached. If we are enabled to pray the prayer of faith, we shall gain the blessing, be it whatever it may. Wow. This is not possible concerning things unpromised or things not according to the divine will. So there is a <clears throat> limitation, right? If it's not promised and also it's not according to God's will. For example, we can use an example. Lord, I need, uh, I pray for a mansion. <laughs> mansion? Is that a promise? The, the mansion that promised the Lord is in heaven, not over here, right? So that is not promised today. He didn't promise that he will give us mansion in this, on this earth. And then, is that the will of God? Why, why do you want to live in a mansion anyway? <laughs> anyway, oh, believing prayer is the shadow of the coming blessing. It is a gift from God, not a fancy of the human will or a freak of idle wishing. Let no doubt, expecting His power, love, and wisdom, wither ye your hearts in approaching Him with our prayers. <clears throat> Note, our King said, believing you shall receive. However, too often in our believing, there is no faith. And yet, when there is faith in our believing, most of the time, there is also doubt. Brethren, let us take this promise of our King sincerely. Let us believe His power without doubtfulness. Let us get more answers from our prayers from our King. Amen. Fourthly, the authority of our divine King was questioned. Verse 23 to 27. The religious leaders ask our King's authority. In verse 23, And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority dost thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? Do you notice the boldness of our king? He was uneducated from a poor family, and yet he was teaching in the temple with authority, with power, right? The religious Jews could not stop him. They could only ask him what authority he has. Where did he get his authority, right? Uh, from in from in teaching the people inside the, their temple. You see? This is the temple of the rulers of the Jews and the Orthodox Jews, right? In verse 24, And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if I which if you tell me I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. Yes, Jesus answered. His answers are always complete, but seldom what his foes expect. Right? What they're expecting, that's not what Jesus will answer. Their question was met by another question. Frequently it will be Wisdom not to reply to the quibbling of the enemies 
of the gospel, but to pose them with some mystery or two. Deep for them. His conditions were fair and reasonable. Our king gave his searching question to the rulers. In verse 25, he said, Jesus said, right? The baptism of John, when, when was it? Right? Where did it come? Where did, where did the authority of John come from to baptize? Uh, from heaven or of men? <laughs> and they reason with themselves. So the rulers are talking about what is the authority of John the Baptist, right? And they said, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, why did you not then believe him? <laughs> so, you know, men pleasers are obliged to be politicians and see which way the majority are going. Like in our nation today in America. Right? The majority is going toward the LBTQ. So the president's what? They're going there too because they're politicians. So our Lord put his questioners on the th horns of a dilemma for these antagonists. <laughs> so in verse 26, they continue. But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. You see? Because they were religious hypocrites, they were caught in their own craftiness. <laughs> in verse 27, and they answered, Jesus and said, we cannot tell. We cannot answer your question. And Jesus said unto them, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. They were in a corner and so no way of escape and therefore they pleaded ignorance. Our king responded similarly. If you don't know, then I will not tell you. <laughs> no, did you notice, brethren, that our king did not answer the questions of these religious leaders where Jesus had his authority? They don't even know where John the Baptist's authority came from. They were fully ignorant of the spiritual works of God in their nation, and yet they are the masters of the scriptures. It's all letters. <laughs> no spiritual things. Praise the Lord that we know where the authority of our king came from. It came from the great I am. He is the self-existing God. <clears throat> Conclusion, let's look at the summary of Matthew chapter 21, verse 1 to 27. We've, we've talked about verse 1 to 11, our humble king arrived in Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And we talk about our holy king cleansed the dirty house of God, the temple. Our fruitful king cursed the fruitless fig tree as an emblem of the Jewish church. The authority of our divine king was questioned. Let me encourage you, my brethren, let us serve our King faithfully and believe His power to make us fruitful and full of blessings. Let's pray. <laughs> 